Can everyone hear me? There we go, there we go. So now we're cooking, okay. Um, so the title of this talk is Observability is Too Damn Expensive. Um, you can probably tell how I feel about the price of observability based on the title. Um, so I do indeed work for an observability company. Um, but just a little background, um, I am Chris. Uh, so I spent 10 years, I was a Java engineer, front end. I worked in the DevOps space, I was an SRE. I did all sorts of different stuff. Um, and now I'm the developer advocate for CoreLogics. We give out free socks. So the guy stole my free socks line. I was raging as I was walking up. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, so if you want to come get some free socks, you're more than welcome. Uh, but I made this talk well before I worked for CoreLogics. Um, I made this talk about half an hour after I received my first bill from a well-known observability provider. And I was like, wow. And then I realized, I spoke to some people and realized that nobody has ever said, wow, this invoice is so low when they get, a, when they get it from there. Yeah, it's, it's insane. So um, what I'm going to do in this talk today is a few things. Um, one, we're going to have a conversation about why. What is actually driving this increase in cost? What's actually really spiking things? Why are things happening at the rate that they're happening? I feel like one day this was a, a relatively minor concern, and then the next day my CFO was messaging me constantly. Um, so, and then the next thing is, what can we do as engineers? So this is if we have DIY solutions, for example, open search stacks, uh, build on top of Grafana and that kind of thing. And what can we do as consumers? Because as we know, observability is kind of split down the middle between build it yourself or buy off the shelf. Those are the, kind of the two options. And it's roughly half and half when I speak to people at conferences about which direction they decided to go. Um, so I'm going to begin with some facts about the data. So at CoreLogics, essentially, um, we started to uh, investigate this. Um, and I started to do it in my own time as well because it became a, a small obsession of mine. Um, the first thing is that it's really normal, not really, really normal, for your observability cost to be about 10% of your cloud budget. But some people are reporting as high as 30% to be normal, which is insane. 30%, uh, if, you, if you build a house for £100,000 and then you say, I want to put some cameras in, and they say, no problem, £33,000, you would be very upset about that. Essentially, this is CCTV for your software, and it should not cost as much as it does. It's crazy. Um, so, Really, uh, you can probably tell how I feel about some of these companies, uh, but the, the essence of it is really straightforward. Um, three big things are driving the increase in the cost of observability. The first is our obsession with microservices. Um, so many companies have, have like a, a website that has you know, traffic of 250 people a month, and somebody decided we need 15 microservices to power that. Um, I don't know why. And in most of these companies as well, in my experience, I consulted for a few of them, and actually, uh, it's like, we have 275 microservices, but most of the work happens in this 15-year-old monolith that's been there for, for you know. um, so, so the, micro, the whole microservices endeavor has is, is driven scalability. It's driven a very adaptable uh, architecture. It's definitely sped up software engineering as well, being able to work in smaller code bases. You've got less of the massive concern, big bang deployments. But it has come at a cost. And these massive interconnected services have driven up the volume of data quite significantly. Uh, but also the complexity of that data as well. Distributed traces now look like a Salvador Dali painting, so it's really quite out there. Um, the second thing is the practices of SREs. So I greatly enjoyed chaos engineering, um, which allowed me to tap into my childhood instinct of destroying things, uh, which was fantastic. Uh, just destroying servers, uh, seeing what happens, breaking things, measuring the outcome. The problem, of course, is that on top of the normal failures that happen, you've also got people like me destroying things in the mix. And that adds new failure modes, new failure scenarios. New failure scenarios increases the, the amount of data you need to cover those scenarios so you actually understand what's going on. Um, and finally, our infrastructure is becoming extremely ephemeral. So now it used to be servers would live for longer than me. Um, and now they are, you know, a 20 second server is very, very normal to run a job and let it go down again, for example, on a Kubernetes cluster, you know? It's very, very normal for your infrastructure to be very ephemeral. However, as your infrastructure goes up and down, changes, moves, pods in a Kubernetes context, for example, are on serverless, where we don't have to care about it, but it still happens. Uh, things are still being moved around servers all the time. Again, all of that movement of software, all of that constant change in your, in your infrastructure and your architecture drives up complexity. Complexity increases the volume of data that we need. So all of that adds up to be this constant sort of self-fulfilling prophecy of the increase in data, the increase in complexity and scale of the data. So the natural conclusion that one draws when you see this is we need less data. Obviously, we just need to just do, make, make less stuff happen. But the, the data isn't really the problem, in my opinion. 
Um, we have a lot of data because we need a lot of data. That the problems that we are solving now are complex and challenging, and that requires a lot of data to keep track of all of it. Um, so what do we do about it? Well, we need to first understand how we use the data, and this was the thing that we did at CoreLogix for a long time to really try to understand how are people actually engaging with this data. If you talk to any data scientist, they will tell you about, they won't, they won't treat all data equally. Some data is really important, some data is less important. In observability, this conversation hasn't really got started yet, and this is kind of just bringing those well-established data science principles into observability. So, number one, straight off the back, 99% um, of index observability data is never searched. And that, that isn't like a made-up figure. We have several thousand customers we assessed. Uh, we spoke to a lot of other companies. We've been doing a lot of research for a really long time. People inde index a huge amount of data, an unbelievable amount of data, and I have no idea why, because they never, ever look at it. Um, sometimes it drives dashboards, sometimes it drives metrics, sometimes it's useful for triggering alarms, but they never actually query it. And there's no point indexing data that you're never going to query, because the whole point of indexing it is easy, fast querying. Indexing is the most expensive thing you will do in your, with your observability data, by far, by far. Like the, co the costs of that outweigh almost everything else. So that's most, most important for your logs and your traces. Um, indexing is incredibly important. If you never search it, that is just money gone that you never really used. 95% of callouts are from the same five errors. So anyone who's managed a system for a long time will know that thing is broken again is a pretty common phrase. Um, so, and yeah, that plagued my life for six years. So yeah, now I'm an advocate, I don't have to worry so much about it, but I still have the nightmares. Um, and the, this is really, really common, but the, the really relevant thing here is lots of SaaS providers will bill by the amount of alarms you have. And so, and the, the, some of these strategies that I see uh, encouraged are thousands of alarms, thousands of them to cover so many different cases. Only five of them ever come off. And you know, so, so really, in the case of alarms, Maybe it's more about having the right alarms. Maybe it's about knowing exactly how the data is used, what's going on in your system in a more deeper level than just cover everything with alarms and hope that something goes off. Now, if you have your own homegrown solution, not a big deal because you're not going to be charged by alarms. Um, and generally, the number of alarms you have doesn't massively impact the performance or optimization of your platform, but it will make it a little tricky to maintain because you're trying to keep track of all you know, the, the 500 different flavors of one outage because somebody decided to procedurally generates a lot of different alarms. So just something to be aware of. 99.9% .9 of queries do not pass seven days, and yet the average retention period for uh, data in high performance index storage is between two and four weeks. Most people will hold their data for at least two weeks, uh, up to four weeks. I don't see much past four weeks. I do see the occasional two months, um, but it's quite rare. Um, and yet uh, we know that the vast majority of people, this data is used operationally, not historically. And so, again, any data scientist would look at that and go, well, it's really clear what we have to do. We have to just index less data, you know? Um, but these are just, the, what we've got, the problem we've got is these patterns of older uh, observability techniques that have kind of just survived and they haven't uh, adapted to meet the new data demands that we're dealing with. And this is my favorite one by a mile, uh, which is quite straightforward. 30% um, of your data is never used at all. So if I'm not talking about not queried, I mean it's literally ingested, you pay for it in whatever form you do, and then you never look at it ever, ever again. Um, and which is remarkable, really. Uh, I say you, me, I was a SRE for several years and I, I did this a lot. Um, and so one of the outcomes of that is that if you have, let's say, 100,000 uh, pounds regular uh, annual invoice, about 30,000 pounds of that is, is just, is, is completely wasted money, completely wasted money. So all of this is to say that we hold on to data for a really long time, we ingest, we index more than we need, and we ingest way more than we need as well. In other words, we're very overcautious, and so we do all the most expensive possible things we can, and then we're surprised when our bills are really, really high. And this is a really, really, really tricky problem to solve. So I'm going to get, this is just like a sort of a background, a kind of overview of the lay of the land, but essentially, um, we are not optimizing, we're not uh, being as efficient as we possibly can be with the data that we've got. So I'm gonna break in now into some of the DIY observability steps. And the idea here is um, if you've kind of built your own stack, some of the patterns to avoid, some of the patterns to go for. Um, this is at a high level, more architectural than the specific technologies themselves, although I can give examples of that if we need to. So 
the very first step, I, I talk about this data, I talk about data waste and that kind of thing, and what tends to happen is people interpret that as, well, we need to just get rid of lots of this data, we need to stop, we never use this, get rid of all the debug logs, whatever. And the problem, just, just a reminder, like, at three in the morning, you're not going to care if your invoice is really high or not. You really need the data that you need. And so the very, very first step before you do anything is understand how your observability data is being used. For example, in Prometheus, Prometheus can produce query logs, so you can actually understand which queries are being run the most. That will give you an idea of which time series metrics are the most important to you, and you'll be able to track those. Likewise, OpenSearch has a slow query log. If you're feeling brave, you can change the definition of slow to anything more than zero seconds and just watch like a massive <laughs> turmoil of things. It's a risky move, uh, so it's, it's not for the faint-hearted, but I've done it once and it was, um, there's a few more new gray hairs on the side of my head as a result, but it was, um, but it gives you a really good insight. And even if you just do that for five minutes on a busy cluster, you know, on a node that isn't receiving a huge amount of traffic, just to get some flavor of what's going on. That's, that's an option that you've got. But almost all of the open source solutions will give you some idea of usage. And this is really, really important. This is step one, because otherwise you're second guessing yourself throughout the entire process of cost optimization. Do we need this? Do we use this? So before you start carving away at debug logs and things like that, how often is, is this data used? How often is it queried? The beauty of looking at the queries, by the way, at the low level in Prometheus and OpenSearch is that any automated solutions you have, so for example, alarms are constantly polling Prometheus to check those metrics, that will also be picked up. So it's a really nice way of capturing both the automated and the sort of human uh, interaction between uh, your observability data as well. The next thing is to define some use cases. So, you don't have to do this. I should have put optional here, maybe, but I am quite zealous about this particular one. So what tends to happen when people understand their data usage is that they go, OK, we've got these thousand different ways in which the data is used. What do we do now? And actually, the really easy thing to do is just most of them can be aggregated into a few sort of cups. So some examples here, logs that are never indexed or never need to be indexed because they're never queried, but they do drive dashboards. Likewise, you can have some metrics that are just constantly in use all the time. They're just really busy, they're super important, drive the critical alarms, one of those big five alarms that go off all the time. Or traces that you ingest and just never look at them ever again. You know? So these are, these are some, some use cases you might want to think about. But I would recommend anywhere between three and five. Three is good, five is pushing it. Some kind of framework where you can categorize the usage of your data, that's going to really help your decision making because you go, okay, this is, this is a bit out of this kind of this one. Okay, cool, put it in the bucket, we'll move on. That will speed up your ability to categorize and then understand the usage of the data. And that's really important for quick, sort of rapid. Because if it takes you a really long time to do this, the most expensive resource in any software engineering outfit is the software engineers. Okay, it makes the infrastructure costs pale by comparison. So if you're taking a really, really long time to do it, the whole global mission of, software, of, of cost optimization is kind of put into jeopardy. So quick decision making is really important there and making some kind of categorization framework really, really important. This pattern, I have implemented this pattern in probably, I would say maybe 11, 12 companies. I apologize to those companies, but now hopefully I'm now writing that wrong. Um, essentially the pattern is really straightforward. You index the data and then you put it in all of, you, this is typical for logs, you index it all uh, in, let's say, open search. You hold it for some amount of time, and then it goes into either like S3, cloud storage, or it just gets deleted, one of the two. Um, the problem with this is you're not being use case driven, as we discussed. Most of your logs won't be searched. Most of your logs will only maybe drive dashboards, maybe drive alarms. Most of your logs will never even, <laughs> never even do anything, or well, at least 30% of your logs may never do anything. So this pattern here is not use case driven, but it is probably the most common uh, usage pattern for observability data in the industry right now. I'm advocating that we uh, leave this one by the wayside and move on. Um, and we kind of try a different approach to how we root this data, how we own this data, how we categorize this data, as I mentioned that phrase before. It's really straightforward. All of the data doesn't have to be indexed. Um, this is kind of a surprise for people when they think, oh, what, what, what else am I going to do? Am I going to put it into open search? No, just find a way of putting it straight into S3. Just archive it directly. If you, if you never use it, but you have to hold on to it, for example, for audit reasons, for regulatory reasons, uh, you might have to hold on to it for whatever reason. Put it straight into the really low-cost cloud storage. It'll cost you like, you know, less than, I think it's like two cents a gigabyte per month, and with compression, that goes down by a factor of five. So it's basically free, um, unless you get the really large, large volumes. Um, 
And you can have different grades. So I've chosen three use cases here, you'll see, by the way. You've got the low-cost uh, cloud storage. Uh, you have the EBS, or magnetic EBS volumes at the top, slightly faster, not blazing fast. And then you have your SSDs, which are very, very fast. Three is a nice number. We like things to come in threes, but this is just an example. The idea is, is that rather than indexing everything up front and then after a period of time making it less available, just don't make highly available the stuff you don't need. And you know what you do and don't need because of your usage statistics. You can do this confidently. Uh, it's really, really important that when you're at this stage, you're doing this with supreme confidence and you're really aware of what's going on. Um, the next thing is um, the, the, the practice of re-indexing. So re-indexing is really important when you have like, put data into an archive and you want to access it again. It is important, uh, but it's not your only option. So for example, if you have data that you, for, uh, this is really important for the regulatory use case. So you have data that you wish to access once a year. And so following the re-indexing model, you would re-index a huge volume of data into your high-performance storage or your high-performance searching. Then you will query it, then you'll delete it all. Very, very expensive thing to do, but also has a massive impact on the other data, especially for a DIY process. You've just ingested a huge amount of data into an open search cluster, for example, uh, that now has slowed down all of the other really important operational data that you've got. And it's not even for an operational reason, it's for a historical reason. So if you archive things in a nice open source format, Parquet, CSV, that kind of thing, you can just query it directly. So you don't have to mess with your operational stuff. And putting a really clear divide, this is a data science principle, between your operational challenges and your reporting challenges. And this is an approach that can do that, is you just treat your long-term storage like a data problem by querying your archive directly, essentially, without the need to re-index. Really powerful technique. What it means is that you can protect the really important operational stuff. Because you're running one query, you know, a few queries a month maybe, that kind of thing, the cost will not mount up. Um, if there's a huge volume of data and you have to run the query lots and lots of times, it might. That will happen in the first instance when you're just kind of getting used to this. But once you have a set of normal, regular queries that you run, it's very, very common to, for this to be very, very quick, very easy, and very cheap as well. So it's a really powerful cost optimization technique. Um, the final thing is stop producing some logs. So there's some of these logs that will, for example, this is a log example. You can do this with metrics. You do this with traces as well. Um, so in the case of um, logs, you, you see it all the time. These applications that produce reams and reams of debug logs, and it's incredibly detailed information about what's going on at the kernel level below. And nobody ever looks at it. Nobody ever touches it. People just get annoyed that it's there because they, they do like last 15 minutes. Then it's like, why, why am I getting told about how many, you know, heap, how the heap space of this particular application when I really want to know about this other thing? So um, have a look at the data that's not being queried because of your usage statistics. Have a look at what's there and just cut it out and, and, and be, be brutal. Is that the software engineering phrase, you ain't going to need it. Um, and it's certainly the case for a lot of these really low level logs. If you really, really need them, like if, you, if you're really nervous about them, maybe there's some obscure regulatory reason why you might need them, straight to the low cost storage. Like don't, don't be like flirting with them in their expensive stuff, straight to the low cost storage, be brutal. Um, because nine times out of 10, you're not going to need them. Um, we have them because we kind of makes us feel safer to have the data than not have the data, and it gives our CFO a heart attack. So it's far better to um, be brutal, and it, it, it's still there. If you can query the archive directly, it's still there. It's not gone. So it's, uh, you still have some of the safety blanket without all of, all of the cost. And of course, you don't have to ingest data in its original form. So, for example, if you have logs are very expensive to store, by the way. Large, large log documents, it's just a big JSON database, you know, it's huge. You don't, but if there's only one field in those logs that's ever useful, why not just turn that log into a time series metric? You know, produce it as a time series metric, drop the original log. Time series metrics are very cheap to hold onto for a very, very long time. And unless they're incredibly high cardinality, um, then you're not really going to have any real performance issues with holding onto them too long either. So transforming the data is a really nice technique. It's going to mean that you have the ability to hold on to this data for as long as you want. You get all of the performance as well, because it's still indexed. There's just a lot less data to index. So let, more than just stopping the data from sending it, you, you know, just putting it into the archive, you just quite simply change it and just refine it down to the, 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 the piece of gold that's hidden inside that log. Really common examples include latency values for how long a particular process took. Um, the amount of memory 
uh, that's in a particular application at a given time. Um, you'll see this a lot with Java applications. So if you use Spring Boot, uh, if, you're have, if you have the pleasure of supporting applications that use Spring Boot, um, then <laughs> I said pleasure without any sarcasm. Everyone was like, oh my god. Um, so the, um, yeah, I was a Java engineer for a while. So I'm kind of like, I'm now paying for my sins. It's fantastic. Um, so the, uh, the idea here is that if you have really noisy, busy logs, the chances are only a few of those values are useful. So just keep those values and drop everything else. Or keep those values and archive everything else. There's another option as well. The, this, is, this is the power of this kind of model. Rather than indexing everything and then just like shuffling around afterwards, shuffle it around, move that all over to the left, and then do the processing up front so that what you've got is precisely what you need and nothing more. The general principle here is quite straightforward. Index very, very cautiously. Indexing is the most expensive thing by a mile. Uh, I work with companies all the time now in my, in, in my role in the company, and it, almost always whenever we see their, their current uh, costs that we're trying to save for them, it's always the same story. The logs and the traces are killing us. We have so many of them. The indexing is really expensive. Um, even if they're doing it themselves, then it's, then, then it's the other way. It's this thing runs really slowly. Why? Because we ingest everything into it, and we hope that it stands up. So. A little bit of like in-house cleaning just before you ingest that data, just before you index it, is really, really important. It's going to save you money. It's also going to save you time. Because at 3 AM, nobody needs a slow open search cluster. We need everything to be fast. And this is, a, this is another facet of this, is the performance of your uh, DIY built observability solution as well. So yes, just whenever anyone says, oh, we'll put it into open search, alarm bells, alarm bells. Index cautiously. Are you sure? Do you need that? Be that person. You'll be really annoying. They'll hate you in the short term. And then in the long term, they'll love you. So, um, so definitely, definitely, this is a principle. Um, the other thing to be aware of is metrics. I, I, I said metrics are really easy to hold on to. They're cheap. They're efficient. They're high performant. There is one evil cousin of metrics, and that is high cardinality metrics. Um, high cardinality metrics are like the person that gets invited to the family dinner and just throws food everywhere. Like they're just not welcome. Um, High cardinality metrics are really useful, um, and it's, it's a bit of a misconception. So people generally advocate for bigger log documents that have got everything you need in them, rather than lots and lots of small log documents. Generally true, generally true, within reason. Um, the metrics, on the other hand, generally favor, or generally work really well with lots and lots of different time series. And uh, for, for example, platform like Prometheus, and they will struggle when you have a single time series with huge, huge numbers of uh, high, high cardinality, high dimensionality. For anyone who's not aware, uh, cardinality is generally that you have labels on your metrics, lots and lots of different values for each of those individual labels. So essentially, there's a million different branches and different ways that that data can be queried. That tends to slow things down. That tends to cost you money. That tends to cause outages to last longer. So just beware high cardinality. You can aggregate your metrics. You can split them up. You can generate smaller metrics with lower cardinality. You can remove some labels. That will definitely help anything to keep cardinality low. Um, that's a cost optimization strategy, but it's also just a performance thing as well. It's going to make your life a lot easier um, at 3 in the morning, which is almost always when this kind of thing comes up. It's, it's never at like midday when everyone's nice and energized and had a coffee. It's always 3 in the morning. So like, you're preparing for that 3 AM scenario is essentially the, the mission. So we've talked a lot about DIY and build it yourself sort of solutions. And one of the beauties of working for a SaaS observability company is I get to talk to a lot of SaaS observability companies. And I get to find out which questions work, which questions don't work, which questions they've prepared for, what their sales reps know are coming, and everything. There's one question that they never, ever, ever see coming. And this is what I'm going to share with you today. This is the, this is the gold dust question that will make sure that you're getting an honest answer. Because they'll go, uh, uh, well, um, I have, uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, great, I've got it. Yeah. So this is, the, this is the beauty of this question. What tools do you offer? for customers to optimize their costs. Not how do I cost optimize in your platform, not do you have any documentation that will help me optimize my cost. What tools have you built? What tools have you invested? What developer time have you invested to, to make it easier for me to optimize my costs? Look for features that drive cost optimization. And the reason for that is because, as I said before, engineering time is incredibly expensive, um, as, as we all know. Uh, and so. Um, if they've, if they've taken the time, they've essentially put their monies where their mouths are, mouths are, and they've said, OK, I'm going to put some developer time on making it easier for my customers to save costs. That means they're serious about it. 
if they haven't done this, and as a general rule, as a rough heuristic, they're going to have some stuff, some cost optimization, but their cost optimization techniques are going to be delete the stuff you don't need. And that's not the most helpful advice in the world. You need to know what stuff you don't need first, for example. So essentially, the, the, the message here is look for the investment they've made in cost optimization. If they haven't made any investment whatsoever, if there's just a few docs here and there, they don't want you to cost optimize. So if you're looking to save money in the SaaS space, this is kind of the killer question. This is the one that's really going to sort of push home uh, and really going to get you the honest answer as well. They never prepare for it either. They never, this is not something that comes up on battle cards or on special things. It's just a, um, a general question to keep aware of. So that's me. Um, you can probably hear like, the, the hook now pulling me off the stage. Uh, but the, um, yeah, so if anyone's got any questions or anything, I'm happy to stick around. Uh, but yeah, these are the social things, whatever people do with them. Um, so um, yeah, this is cost optimization observability. Very, very brief summary. Index cautiously. Don't believe people when they say they need the data. Always develop user statistics. And always, always ask, how have you invested in cost optimization? What tools have you built that are going to enable cost optimization? That is everything. Thank you very much for listening, guys. I really appreciate it.